Thank you, Joe. There is something that I should mention before uh, we open the floor. I think about Bruce, I think, uh, is not here anymore, and it's working here for him. But uh, Bruce would know that the kinds of remarks that, uh, Bruce Rollins, I mean, uh, the, uh, uh, the kinds of remarks that Gramsci made about Uncle Tom's Cabin, we were reading the uh, graduate applications. It's, uh, it's, a pr it's, it's, it's submitted as a uh, new way of looking at Uncle Tom's Cabin by an African-American scholar who applied to Columbia, and it was, I mean, I was looking at Bruce and smiling. It's quite interesting to see how Gramsci culminates there. Uh, anyway, that I, I wanted to mention that, and I wanted to say that uh, I, this will be the moment when I, suffering from bursitis, will be walking around. I just, uh, just once will do it because I'm beginning to feel the, the pains overcoming me, uh, into, uh, making me an anthropophagus. But uh, <laughs> the thing is, the, the, so let's just have the first question and then I'll get up. guidance. How can they have a new guidance? This is his problem. 
it seems so clear, yes, there are the peasants who have no education and there are the intellectuals and they can guide them by creating a new historical block, not anymore being in this old block with the big agrarians and so on. But now, what to do with a new suborbiter? And I think uh, he, he really, in, in some way, he, is, um, he, he remembers this writings and really subverts uh, what he wrote before and said, now, what can they do? And here comes this idea of the, um, the doctor of oneself, uh, let us say, and, and he admits to Tatiana, this was the big part of the di great discussion with Tatiana, he admits that it may not be possible for everyone, and then he goes back and says, okay, um, maybe we have to develop something that he then did not develop further, but I think it's very interesting, and it is um, related to the autobiographical notes, something that he calls mneme, memory, the Greek concept of mneme. Those who are in this situation, who are themselves intellectuals, he says Dostoevsky was in such a situation, and we have a situation today that it is worse because of the terror. What can they do? They can go back and see what is the broken part in the chain. And they have to go back and then rebuild um, their relation to the society. And the task of the intellectuals there would be not to make too big, uh, not to have too big aims, but not, not to say to the people, you have to do this and that, and this, uh, um, you have to make revolution in a situation when the um, uh, Nazi uh, Germany uh, just starts in, in 33 uh, with its terror uh, regime, and when also Mussolini, uh, Mussolini's regime gets worse and worse, and you know the Communist International at that moment said this would be the moment of doing revolution in Germany and in Italy, it was absurd, and he called it perverse. It is quite, sim uh, quite simple, of course he has in a way to, to cipher, uh, to, to uh, use ciphers, but it is quite simple to decipher what he means. Uh, that he means we have to go back. Uh, where did the development go in a way that puts those groups into a subaltern position? And he also says, we, yeah, who has the responsibility for this? Uh, this should not take place because people will not be able to resist. There comes the, the example of the anthropophagus. People will change. Uh, there will be molecular changes. Um, instead, there has to be a reconstruction of alternative development. So I see it connected in this way. Uh, this would also be a task of intellectuals, but also a very self-reflexive position of what the intellectuals, and mainly the intellectuals in the political, within the political movement, did in those years. Thank you. Um, the, um, and of course, I'm just saying this because we, I hope we will come to this. Uh, perhaps one should think of this um, historical analysis and then the, um, uh, the idea that uh, we should go back to see where it went wrong and start redoing it toward the right solution. If this were indeed put together with a morphology which contains, and this is why I was mentioning Kant, which contains the, uh, the um, irreducible uh, possibility of this kind of dislocation, what kind of educational idea would be forged if that is taken into account and not only perceived as a, a, a problem within the historical narrative? I don't think either can be ignored, but I do hope that at some point we will come to consider these. Is there another question? Yes. There are two. Thank you. Uh, thanks to all three of you, and uh, particularly
path of inquiry by Johnson and his work that has not been adequately followed. Uh, I want to just invite all three of you to comment a little bit on the on marginality and subalternity, which in my mind go very closely together. Uh, and, and the fact that Gramsci himself um, experienced marginality as an islander, as an insular person, and he became very conscious of that. In fact, there's a wonderful passage in the notebook where he talked about unsag, or a Sardinian. Uh, I'm quite clear, I'm quite sure it was referring to himself, that um, he, he harks back to his experience of growing up uh, in, a, uh, in a place and in a time that made it very difficult to emerge, to, to get in touch with, let's say, more advanced currents of thought and, and all that, which then did happen in Carina. But he, so, you know, it's interesting. I wanted to link this marginality and subalternity and then tie it in with, with his relationship with both Eugenia and, um, and uh, Julia. The fact is that he fell in love with Julia, not with Eugenia, right? Yeah. Now, does that, does that tell us anything about the world of feeling in Gramsci, which as you very correctly said, uh, he repressed, or he tried to repress in order to achieve a full uh, consciousness and nationality of his thinking. He, he probably, as you pointed out, he repressed the emotional side of himself. But I'm sure that that emotional side of himself was always there as reflected in his choice of Julia, not Eugenia. Eugenia was a very dominant Bolshevik. I mean, Julia was a Bolshevik also, but in, in, a, in, in much less strident tones, right? I mean, it was a different personality. So, uh, I don't know, I, I, I'd like to invite your comments about this. One other aspect I wanted to, uh, to, to raise is this notion. Um, now, uh, it sort of slipped my mind, but this, this, this sub oh, oh yeah, the other point I wanted to make is subaltern is a military term. Mm -hmm. And Gramsci liked military analogies, you know, the war of positions and the war of the yeah. frontal assault. And he was the theorist of the war of positions. He became that in the light of the defeat of the, of the uh, socialist revolution. Now, uh, the subaltern's role in the military is to take orders. Not to provide strategies, uh, but rather to carry out someone else's instructions, someone else's orders. Uh, and I'm wondering whether that sense of, of uh, you know, how you experience life, do you experience life as someone who's carrying out someone else's conception of strategy, or are you then, or are you working towards a situation in which you become the decider, you become the initiator of, of enterprises? <coughs> Anyhow, that's... <coughs> Pablo, perhaps you want to mention your question as well, and then the three of us can. Okay, wonderful. We can also interject as well in the concept of subalternity, and you were mentioning in your paper that uh, Granchi was struggling against the state in a super term himself uh, as an Italian prisoner, and he was aware as well that Julia could be uh, as well an object of subalternity because of the revolutionary, post revolutionary Italian Soviet Union. But I'm very interested in the dynamics between the two people here, between Gramsci and Julia, and the strategy. If there is any strategy that Gramsci was trying to create a subalternity relationship with Julia in the way that, for me, those letters are very violent against one, one person's attitude to education. So I have three questions related to that, which is, what's Julie's strategy to, uh, to that violent language? Gramsci wrote about you know, the education they, she was uh, developing the kids. The other thing is that, how the relationship of this strategy, Gramsci tried to create a subalternative relationship with Julia, illuminates the contradictions between emotional responses and education ideas or philosophical ideas about one subject, how acts can contradict uh, uh, specific ideas about those things. And finally, uh, probably uh, because the Gramsci's reaction or Gramsci's uh, ideas about uh, education from a practical point of view in these letters contradict a lot the philosophical image we have of Gramsci it could be the reason researchers 
didn't want to see those those letters because they are very you know they are putting in, in some not very good light the attitudes mm -hmm. from a practical point of view the attitudes of Ramsey uh, in his relationship with his women. Mm -hmm. no. uh, how shall we? Uh, shall I let Joe have <coughs> the first word and then I let you answer and then I will bring up the end because that's where you know we have a we have a build up. Okay, I'll, I'll do very brief. The first, on, uh, in response to Frank, um, marginality and subalternity. Um, it's interesting that when he, uh, he sees himself, sorry, he sees Sardinia, let me say, as having been marginalized, uh, in, uh, with that in very sort of terminology very early on. And when he goes to Turin uh, within a couple of years, He's already talking about having uh, uh, seen uh, the processes of modernity and modernization, which have not only uh, generated what was in those days an, an incredible demographic shift, you know, southerners going up to Turin to work in the Fiat factory, but also the, the rapid, whichever call it, sort of modernization, I don't like this word exactly, but uh, in, in the mind of the workers. You know, he sees them getting organized and so on and so forth. So people coming from the margins to the cosmopolitan and industrial center, who now, however, develop the notion of, or come to understand the ways in which they are supported. Uh, now, of course, it is not only the people coming from the margins who are supported, but it is, uh, they, they actually become aware of their subalternity precisely because they are in the condition of modernity. The problem with the southerner or with the Sardinian for the most part, not all of course, because there, there are the Sardinian autonomous who are, mm -hmm. that, but the problem with them is that there is, that they are not even aware or cannot use a concept such as subalternity precisely because there's nobody among them who speaks along with them because he says the people who are capable of articulating a position either are like Croce and Fortunato, that is to say, they see their intellectual heritage, legacy, and ability as making them European intellectuals, or they're the me middle range intellectuals, the priests, the notaries, and so on, whose role is comfortably uh, uh, bestriding the, the rural, you know, peasant population, conservative by nature anyway, or by culture anyway, and, sorry, not by nature, by culture, but, and uh, the landowning class and so on and so forth. So I find this dynamic very much worth exploring, that the, that the very uh, uh, understanding of one subalternity is not something that happens spontaneously and has a very complex relation to marginality. Secondly, on the question of subalternity linked with the military, this is true early on, but don't forget that the point and Gramsci wants to make is that the, once you, you hit on the concept of the subaltern, it is a condition to be overcome. Yes. Uh, and, and so it's not like he's, you know. Uh, uh, and, and finally, uh, and, and on this side, defer to others, and Frank knows more about this than I do with, with his work with the letters. But it's, it's very easy, and I was among the, the ones who, who fell into this uh, er, in my earlier reading of Gramsci. To, to read uh, Gramsci's tone in his writings to Tanya and Julia and so on as uh, peremptory, uh, 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 sort of dismissive. When you read the exchanges, you realize there's a, there's a different key that you have to get into. So when Gramsci says, what a ridiculous thing you did. You think, and you say, my God, I mean, this is a woman devoting her days in Italy to helping him. How would you write at her like that? But then when you start reading the entire vocabulary, you, you just have to, I don't know what the word is, but you re-attune your ear. That the, the, the language is not as vile, it's, it's not actually violent once you get used to it. It's, it's harsh, it's forthright, but there's nothing, Gramsci never concedes to niceties. And they knew that. So, mm -hmm. But you know, it's a question of interpreting style. Yeah, thank you for all these um, very important points you gave, also for Frank. 
Um, just, I take it, I'm taking up the last one, <laughs> which I remember most. Um, I think uh, marginality and um, subalternity, this uh, gets a totally new aspect when the subaltern comes to be a leader. That is for him also a problem. And I have here a quote that is still not translated. Uh, there is no um, English translation of it. Maybe you can translate it when I read it in Italian. Ma quando il subalterno diventa dirigente e responsabile dell'attività economica di massa, il meccanismo appare a un certo punto un pericolo imminente. Avviene una revisione di tutto il mondo di pensare perché è avvenuto un mutamento del mondo sociale di essere. So, uh, maybe you can briefly I give uh, the content sure. and... Um, where, where is it here? Yeah. Uh, but when the, in quotes, subordinate becomes a leader and, respons and responsible for the economic activity of the mass, or of the mass, of the mass, the uh, mechanism, the structure of things, appears at a certain point an imminent danger. And a revision takes place of the whole mode of thinking because a change has taken place in the work, in the very existence of the social order, of the, so of the existing social order. Okay, I will let uh, Osla go on with her answer, but let me comment on one thing. Evo Morales, the president of, uh, of Bolivia, who was by all uh, definitions a subaltern, right? Um, high school education, Aboriginal, etc., knew this well enough because he was a smart guy, exceptional subaltern, and he chose uh, Alvaro Garcia Linares, Linera, who was in fact a new left review type leftist, bourgeois leftist, as his vice president so that he could negotiate precisely this kind of change. I just wanted to mention this because we never talk about anything other than, you know, Gramsci uh, theorizing. Once upon a time, yes, once upon a time. But there's much more to say, but I think I'd rather hear you. No, thank you very much. Uh, I, I didn't think of this, but of course, this is very, very uh, recent, yeah. uh, what, he, what he says. Um, and therefore, I would say, Frank, yes, marginality in all ways, but mainly um, in the way that he sees that big changes are taking place, revolutions, mm -hmm. passive and active revolutions. And in this way, uh, society changes and totally new groups are coming up um, mm -hmm. with this problem of, of uh, what their subalternity creates for all of, of um, the, for the whole society. Um, so uh, then now I get, uh, go back to, um, to your remarks, uh, Julia and Eugenia, very briefly. Um, there exists the wonderful letter from Gramsci where he criticizes Julia very uh, harshly and then says, but of course, that's why I love you. Um, by, because you are Julia and not someone else. And now, of course, comes up, does he love her because she is so weak and she is so emotional and, and so on? That was, was what you asked. Um, well, I, I really think that um, Gramsci, when he says, I loved, uh, I was too aesthetic, um, I loved Renaissance, but now I'm undergoing reform. He, of course, thinks of both of his own um, feelings towards um, uh, this whole emotional world. And um, it seems that he is very harsh, but at the same time, I, I uh, must say, and I brought it to the fore, of course, I don't want to, to um, neglect it. Uh, but at the same time, it is really necessary to read it with these keys uh, that he always had to be aware of the, all the ways of, of uh, surveillance. And sometimes, and he called it himself, pirandellismo um, in forma di lettera. Uh, pirandellismus in, pirandellism in the form of letters. And 
So he often wrote at the same time, on the same day, a letter to Julia and a letter to Tatiana. And he knew that Tatiana would then send also the letter that went to her. And in the same letter of 32, when Gramsci proposed to Julia to get separated, because he said, well, she can start anew, he saw the, the pressure on her was too harsh and maybe it would be a better life for her getting separated from him. In the same letter, uh, uh, in this, on the same day, he writes a letter to Tatiana saying, don't think I don't love her. I even love her more than ever. It's, I think he never says to Julia, I love you. Never, never ever. But he says to Tatiana, I love her so much. And then she sends this letter to Julia. So it is a way, really, of, in a parentalistic way, expressing uh, these I feelings. I should mention, there's also, and you, I think, have mentioned this in your letter also, uh, there's, a, a psych sorry, there's a psychological problem, I mean, which is for very individual here. Uh, Gramsci says that he cannot write to Julia about his emotions because when he tries to, the first thing he thinks of is the censor. Remember, he says, I just cannot do it. I, I cannot write my, my feelings knowing that there is this figure, you know, reading, my, saying, I love you. So he, he uh, really reminded me because he has no inhibition telling Tatiana, it's like narrating something. But he's really inhibited. And I don't know, uh, Ursula would know more than me. Uh, I suspect, by coincidence, that the same is true at the other end, uh, from Ursula's end. I'm sorry, from, from Julia's end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, um, that, that's often not so clear, at least for him. And we, we, um, I, I don't still know whether we can judge. At a certain point, he says, you are among those who have condemned me to prison. Uh, so uh, sometimes he really is, is very much taken by this idea that she, is in, she cannot free herself from, from this sub subordinate position. And this is what he, he thinks. Um, if she remains in this circle, <coughs> also in this political circle, then she has condemned him too. And this makes it still... Um, more diff difficult. I, can I just say one thing to uh, what Joe commented? I think it's very, very interesting, I think, what, what you said, that often we have uh, really uh, autobiographical uh, references um, in the letters and in the quaderni, uh, it, and it is um, very difficult to, to find the way to how he relates to his own experience. And I think, I just wanted to say it, I think one of the parts that is most interesting in, in the uh, notebooks and in the letters, he refers to this in both, is his Dante uh, interpretation. Um, it is so interesting, you know, he, um, he interprets a part of Dante where Dante comes to the hell and meets Cavalcante and Farinata, two persons from Florence. Um, and um, they were kept in this fort between Ghibellines and Guelphs. And they were condemned to a form of hell where one cannot see the presence. One can see uh, the past and can have some look at the future, but cannot see what happens in the present. And I really think also how he describes them, that the one person, that is the Cavalcante, who only hears that Gramsci uses the, the imperfect, the, the uh, time of the past, uh, makes him think his son is dead, he cries and he goes to hell again and cannot follow the conversation, whereas his son is alive. That is his interpretation of immediate passion, I think, um, that uh, the one person who is not able to, to uh, resist this immediate passion will not have more um, insight into the, um, the history as a whole, but that also he sees himself, of course, in this position of not knowing what the presence is. Yeah, of not having this um, 
possibility to, to interpret the present and just to look at the, at the past. So it, I, I think it would be worthwhile reading it again. Well, um, uh, yes, Dante, I mean, I was just thinking that it is to Dante that Primo Levi turns in Auschwitz. It's a, I mean, that's, we, sh we could discuss the ideas that Primo Levi takes in order to understand the concentration camp, what passages of Dante, so that's very interesting indeed. Um, but, uh, uh, okay, I'll begin with the military position, subaltern <coughs> military position. In fact, two people, one of them, Michel Barrett, uh, have written about uh, the subaltern as military and related it to uh, this Gramsci's thinking and somewhat to my thinking. But the uh, supposedly the Russian translation of my Can the Subaltern Speak, the first title was Can the Junior Officer Speak? Oh, but, uh, but then it was, yes, but then it was, it was changed. Anyway, but it's very interesting, taking orders, yeah? Because I wanted to, I mean, in my response, I wanted to, uh, to talk about Gramsci's description of himself, that his, his that, that letter that's just before his, his uh, crisis, the, um, that this historical situation has transformed him yeah. to an extent, and this is why when I teach Gramsci, I'm completely transported thinking that he could understand this without an experience, but today you spoke about the experience, because the teaching, uh, you know, I have been a training teacher, this is why George Orata was so keen on what I was talking about, in uh, the very backward rural areas in my state of West Bengal for the last 25 years. And one of the things that one, that one has to learn, and this is also Gramsci, the intellectual puts himself or herself into a master-disciple relationship where the disciple is the intellectual of history, not necessarily that some Christian idea that the Sahaja knows everything. This quote already shows uh, an agreement with Paulo Freire that that is not so. But the, it's what I have had to learn is that when, and he has an old settler colony when the Indo-European speakers came, right? And these people, the outcasts and the uh, aboriginals, the scheduled castes and the scheduled tribes, they have been bred up, and I've shared this with them, only for manual labor and not for intellectual labor for millennia. And so it's a cognitive crime because intellectual labor is punished because they must obey, take orders. See, so to that extent, the, the, the cognitive transformation in such people is, of course, much more alarming than to Gramsci, although, of course, it's wonderful, horribly alarming than to Gramsci in jail. You're talking about a normality that contains this being brought up as the person and persons, both genders, who take orders. And the woman is in a double whammy because the woman in this kind of situation, as Melanie Klein knew, the man becomes the one who comes home and beats the wife because outside the, the man is also only taking orders. And this brings me to the question of violence, the question of the competition between Eugenia and Julia, and all that stuff. We are not ready to read that stuff yet. The language of love, so-called, quote, love, unquote, is an extremely historically and patriarchally charged word. And in this case, what Gramsci says, the censorship is a different thing, but even what, not wanting the censor to read that, what Gramsci says and what uh, Eugenia says and what Julia says, and Tatiana is a little bit different because we are able to break through ideological uh, stuff, otherwise we would all be only determined. But all of that stuff, we have to remember, history is larger than personal goodwill or personal intelligence. I don't think we are ready to read that stuff for you know, diagnosing the relationship between Eugenia, Julia, Gramsci, and Tatiana, we have to be careful. And indeed, to me also, it looks like violence, and I don't want to excuse that. It does look like violence. The, but the thing is, why does it come out when it is spoken by a man whose idea of education is quite different? That, uh, that historical stuff is something that we have to investigate with incredible delicacy 
I don't believe we can just kind of go this way, go that way. She's a Bolshevik, she's a uh, nervous breakdown, she's a wife, Gramsci is violent, etc. I think we are not ready yet. A lot of work has to be done. So on the one side, there is the Kanchan morphology that I'm asking you to think about, and on the other side, I'm asking you to think about the historical task of uh, feminism after the first move, which I mentioned in the introduction. As for uh, marginality and subalternity, it seems to me as, uh, that, that the subaltern is in a specific kind or kinds of margin. Uh, Gramsci, and the one you mentioned wonderfully, the military idea of just taking orders. The, uh, it's a position, as I have said, without identity. And as you said, it's a position that one must overcome. I mean, it's, I mean, one can't perhaps overcome it oneself, but that's another discussion. But anyway, so it seems to me that it is upon the definition of the margins that this claim so much depends. When I said that with traveling theory, we should not encourage uh, US uh, critics who always diagnose themselves as subaltern and therefore think that the subaltern can speak as they suffer from yet another attack of logoria. It's in this, it, therefore, the idea of the definition of the margin, as Gramsci expands it, I have myself also seen a woman as the inhabitant of that subaltern margin, as the first, and then moved along to see that the other one that Gramsci says, that they are not, in, not citizens, that is to say, they cannot use the, uh, what you call it, use the, the structures of the state. They are, they cannot uh, use them. That I felt that it must weigh the other one just as much as we must allow the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, very, uh, the very tight readers of Gramsci to understand that the margin is not just political in the narrow sense. I think it needs to be said, for example, that the guy who burnt himself in Tunisia. It was a singular subaltern. And the, the, this subaltern could speak because paradoxically a political will had been generated by the predatory state. That's a different way of understanding it from the other places in North Africa and West Asia, the, the place where it began. So therefore, that would be my idea about marginality. It's not, as Frederick Jameson once famously said, mistakenly, that anyone who feels oppressed is subaltern. No, the, uh, the, uh, the margin is defined in order to claim that marginal as subaltern and or the group as subaltern group or subaltern class so that in order to uh, make the subalternity go away, one actually engages with the nature of that margin, infrastructure in other words, mm -hmm. rather than simply say that in this case, the diagnosis of subalternity is correct and it's not only political in the narrow sense. That's really a, a blind alley. So thank you for your very wonderful questions. I believe the time has come for us to go and eat a little something. Please come back at 1.45 when we will be, 145 it is, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. At 145, when we will be gathering in this room to hear the Kanchans and the Gramchans together. Thank you very much for your attention and uh, have a good lunch.